place. Noswetha, good evening. Noswetha. And Kroiso, that's our word, word of welcome. It's the old British word of welcome. It would have been spoken across this whole land south of where is now Hadrian's Wall until the sixth century. So you're most welcome here tonight. Tonight is going to be uh, an evening split into two parts. I wanted to start by giving you an overview of what the Brythonic tradition is, essentially. What, in the past kind of 25 years, I've been piecing together, not just me, but others of my generation have been piecing together, finding the old ways of this land once more from under the veneer of kind of the, the Methodist and kind of Christian stronghold that has been certainly over Wales for a very long time. Uh, and then we're going to, there's nothing better than experiencing, really. So we're going to do some work and I've mapped out um, some places to contextualize this place. And I want to bring the layers of story in the land here into this place so that we can celebrate it and find ourselves in the center of it. Now, I'll be honest with you. Most of the time when I do this work, I take people out there and we would have done it over three days and we would have made pilgrimage to each of these places because I truly believe that that's what our ancestors did and that they didn't feel that they could wield those places, the energy of those places until they'd gone there and honored them. But tonight we're gonna to have to find another way. And if we're up for it, it will work. And that means kind of sending our consciousness far, going deep into some gentle trance and working with each other as a group. And then towards the end, we will co-create a lovely ceremony to honor this place and begin, bless this place with all those kind of inferences from the story of Londinium to begin the Wisdom Keepers series here. So to begin then, I better tell you a little bit of how I came to this work. I was born here, well not exactly here, but in a place called Caer Verdin, Merlin's Fort in West Wales. I was born to a Welsh-speaking family uh, and I am a member of the Demetai tribe. That was instilled in me from a very young age. I was told the stories of Merlin's Vale from a tiny little grasshopper. But there was nothing more than that. There was nothing more than the stories. What you see here is Merlin's old oak. And the story goes that when old Merlin's oak will tumble down, so will drown Carmarthen town. And so this old oak, which is supposed to have been the old oak that the soldiers of Vortigen found Merlin beneath before they took him up to Dinas Emrys to unleash the dragon power of this land and make his first prophecy, that they found him playing beneath this old oak and it was a very important oak to him. Now, likelihood is it wasn't exactly that oak, but the tradition goes is that his original oak, somebody kept one of the acorns and planted it, and the same thing happened again, and this was the last of those generations. And when I was a child, I used to go to school on the bus, and the, this was in the middle of a roundabout, and increasingly it got encased in concrete, encased in concrete, until eventually it was taken down. And it was split in half, and one half went to the museum in Carmarthen, and the other to the uh, town hall. And the next year, Carmarthen had the worst floods it's ever, ever experienced. The power of story, the power of this ancient myths of this land is very important. So I grew up with all those stories, but when I was about seven or eight, I was uh, in the woods near where my father grew up. My father had grown up on a farm and my cousins happened to live in the next door farm. And we were playing in the woods and we were playing hide and seek. And I'm sure a number of you will have had some kind of similar experience early on that switches on the spiritual button. Sometimes it happens in the 20s, sometimes in the 30s. But I was about seven or eight years old and I ran headlong because I was looking for somewhere to hide into the middle of a clearing of trees. And I stopped dead. There was a shaft of beautiful sunlight coming down through those leaves into this really soft grass and I stepped into that light and for a moment I just felt connected to absolutely 
everything. It was the most magical moment of my life, actually. And I was the same when I walked out of that pool of light. But the problem was, is that when I went home and asked about this, nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody had the language to talk about it. I'd grown up in chapel, going to Sunday school every day. <coughs> and I asked the minister about it, and he kind of poo-pooed it. Nobody was speaking about this stuff, and yet I knew there was something more. There was something more the adults weren't telling me about, something about my own culture, my own heritage, that nobody either knew about or wanted to speak about. So as a teenager, I went searching in high magic to begin. And I studied uh, as a high magician for a number of years and then decided it was just too scientific for me. I was tired of getting the right candles and the right incense and the right time of day and kind of legging it all to the top of a hill and trying to do something. It was too kind of hard. Nothing. I learned a lot from it. I learned about intention the intention of magic. So I went looking for Wicca, and I found Wicca, and I enjoyed that a great deal, and I spent years training as a priestess of Wicca. And then one day it dawned on me that I was in the middle of a beautiful woodland near Oxford, and I was calling on Greek gods and goddesses. And yet I knew through the myths that I'd grown up with that we had perfectly good deities and genus loci for this land, but nobody was talking about them. In my first initiation at the age of 16, when they asked me, why do you come here? Why do you seek this knowledge? My answer was, because I want to bring the, 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 ways, the spiritual ways of my own people back, and I need to learn first. I need to learn from other cultures in order to be able to draw back my own. And I'd forgotten about that, actually, until a few weeks ago, I was lecturing in Schumacher, We've got Mark here from Schumacher tonight. And I was preparing a talk, and I suddenly realized that I could trace a golden thread all the way back to that moment when I made that vow. And it, as all of you will know who are interested in magic, if you make a vow in those kind of circumstances, all the worlds, all the gods of everywhere, all the ancestors hear you and they really keep you to it. I don't think I knew what I was setting myself up for as a 16 year old, but they obviously did. And along the way, it's kind of cost me a lot. It's cost me a marriage. It's cost me a lot of challenges and I've dropped off. I'm sure some of you here tonight will be frustrated because you don't feel that you're quite on your spiritual path. You're almost there, but you're not quite. <coughs> We've all done that. It's all part and parcel of, of learning. But gradually, gradually, life brought me back onto it. And I've spent the last 20 years really trying to piece together the frayed threads of this ancient Brythonic tradition. And what I'd like to do tonight, when the work that I have to do in this world right now, is to share what I know with as many people as possible because I think it's valuable. I think it's valuable for those of us living here because it's the tradition of the British Isles. It might be that it's more apparent in Wales because the place names and the myths seem to be located there, but they are the matter of Britain. They belonged to all of this island until the Anglo-Saxon invasion in the mid sixth century. And so I want to kind of open the doors, share with you what we know, because we're all searching. We're all searching for a very good reason. And as many people as can kind of find it here and start to work with this land, the better it'll be for this place. We are, as I don't need to tell you, in an extraordinary age when humanity is in trouble. That's a lot of what the wisdom keepers, the work that Ben has been doing, bringing them together, talk about, is how do we sort this out? How can our different spiritual traditions help this? We're more drugged, we're more anaesthetized, we drink more alcohol, we're more cruel to each other and to nature, to animals, to the creatures of this earth. We're impoverished in terms of our society and our community. We hardly relate to our children anymore. 
we communicate more with gadgets often than we do with each other. We inject ourselves with crazy, crazy things in the aim to stop the aging process. And the world needs elders. What the hell are we doing? What is this glorification of the, youth, of the young? Instead of going out and working on the land and growing potatoes, we go into gyms and we do the artificial things like lab rats, really. I know it's necessary because of the life we have to keep fit, but it is when you start to think about it, we're creating a really crazy world. And our planet's struggling too. You know, the plastic continents that we now have in the ocean, what's happening, mass extinction, pollution, planet warming, the two things, humanity going off kilter and the planet going off kilter, these two things are not isolated incidents, they're completely aligned. As humanity, since we arrived on this earth, however many million years ago, if we took all of that time and put it into a day, it is only in the last nanosecond, it's gone, that we have started to live in isolated boxes, in buildings like this that keep out the wind and the rain and not absolutely bound to the land. And that disconnect makes us a little crazy. It makes us lose something of our own deep humanity because we are nature. And it also makes us value the land and the earth much less. Many are searching, I'm sure many of you here are searching. Many are searching the world, working with shamans, wonderful, wonderful people who are giving and trying to share their traditions with us. And my partner runs Kai Mabon in North Wales, I'm not sure some of you might know it. And we have many of the visiting shamans coming there and I always like to talk to them. And one of the questions I always have is, is why are you doing this? What is the purpose of bringing your medicine and your traditions here, and every one of them, the answer is always the same. We want to open the eyes of those people in the West so that you can find your own tradition and your own center again. But very often what they see is that we do what we do best here in the West, is we consume. We just keep consuming theirs. We consume their medicine, we consume their tradition, we appropriate it. And we're not doing the work of looking at what is here right beneath our feet. What is our land right? What is our birthright? What is the connective spiritual tissue between us and the land here? It's obvious why we need to do this. But here's a really great quote from Stephen Harding. We need to make peace with nature by rediscovering and embodying a worldview that reconnects us with a deep sense of participating in a cosmos suffused with intelligence, beauty, intrinsic value, and profound meaning. The difficulty is we've fallen in love with the earth. We've fallen out of love with the earth. We've forgotten to love it. And maybe, just maybe, we have no other purpose on this earth but to acknowledge the wonder of this planet, to see its beauty one idea. What we have to do, and environmentalists are finding this, that the scare tactics don't work. They just frighten people and make us overwhelmed. What does work is helping people to reconnect with their land, to fall in love with it again, to find their place in nature, their intrinsic place in nature. And that ultimately is what the work that I'm trying to do with introducing people to the Brythonic tradition here, and I know all the other wisdom keepers are trying to do too. Yeah, we're not seeing what's beneath our feet. We're often looking far afield and not seeing what's in clear view in front of us. Because it's difficult, it's more difficult, it's more fragmented. This is what's beneath our feet here. Class Meredith. Merlin's Enclosure, it's the earliest documented name for the islands of Prydine. It was also known as the Island of Honey, and it became known as the Islands of Prydine, which has become known in the English language as Britain. Prydine is still the word that we use 
in Welsh for the British Isles. And it's one of the most mythically rich, historically rich, small, tiny outcrop of land anywhere in the world. It's incredibly rich. You cannot walk anywhere without tripping over a myth, a legend, a god, a deity, an ancestor, a story that is connected to our deep roots here. And when I say that, I'm not saying that this is just for people of Britain. We are all indigenous to the earth. If this is where your fleet are planted right now, I invite you to inquire into its spiritual traditions because you'll find that the land speaks to you. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, ah, but I'm Spanish. I said, yes. And she said, well, maybe your land won't speak to me. I've never known a piece of land say, no, sorry, I'm not speaking to you because you're not of this place. Land just loves to communicate. Nature loves to communicate. Thank you. I want to start by reading you, just to give you a little indication of the richness of this tradition. This is an ancient piece of poetry about the soul at Enide that is probably about 2,000 years old. It was probably carried on the oral tradition for about 1,000 years before it was written down in my hometown of Carmarthen in a monastery there in a, what we know as an ancient text called the Black Book of Carmarthen sometime around about 1240. Enaid kid am ganit, im anghen di genit, gwir iw gai, inhev pa the ostre imetgov, nak iorve, nak anghev, na diet, na dechre, o seith leinad pan im seseniad, o seith creadir pam in dodeth ar pier, oc tan in. Llachar pam in rodet par, orden pryd deyar y myn dehae adal. Orden gwynt golev llefinrec nom da, ordent nil y mynet y ceisau keton cyt. Oeten blodef gwyd a fintneb clwyd. Am neisiau dwyt am dodeth am deunid, enaid cyt im genid. If you click that again, I'll show you what it is in English. Soul, in truth I was made blameless, not for my own sake, not for deaths, not for endings nor beginning. I was blessed by the seven elements, burnished by the seven created beings. I was spark of fire when first kindled. I was dust of the earth untouched by grief. I was the wild wind, less evil than good. I was the stag hunting mist of mountains. I was tree blossom scattered across the earth. Spirit blessed me and placed me in matter. So, so was I made. In our ancient poetry, in this tradition, we are made from the flowers of the trees, from fire, from earth. We are intrinsically a part of the web of life and it is a part of us. It's the basic precept of the Brythonic tradition. But we're jumping ahead of ourselves. So what I thought we would do is to look a little bit about the story of how this tradition began and how it developed so that we know where we've got to today. So we're going to look at the roots. It's as old as the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic. The people that have been here since the end of the last ice age are still here. It's still the same DNA. There is a tradition as old as that that goes back layer upon layer upon layer building one moment upon the other. It begins with the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who lived really close to the land. They depended on the earth and found ways of keeping balance. This is the same kind of culture as the Aboriginal Australians <coughs> that walk, find ways 
pathways, set down the first pathways going from the hunting grounds to places where there are good foraging for food and seeds to places where they can find flint. And along the way, they notice places that are special and they begin to interact with them. <coughs> this is Cresswell Caves, occupied 43,000 to 10,000 years BC. And there we find some of the, um, the earliest cave uh, art in the United Kingdom, showing what, maybe what they hunted, but also something of the dreaming. <coughs> Trance or dreaming seems to have been a core part of our ancestors' experience of the spiritual. And in some places, like in the Lascaux Caves in France, they show us that dreaming in incredible creativity. It comes out of the wall. It's not just what they're seeing on the plains, it's also strange creatures. Sometimes they share the dream. They paint horses that appear to come out of the walls, out of stone. And when the light flickers on them, it looks as if they're moving. Incredibly clever, incredibly beautiful sharing of what they see. And the Colombians or England seems to be doing really well. They're sharing their dream with us too tonight. Now every so often, even as early, early ancestors, they show us something of the spirit this picture comes from the Lascaux Caves in France, but it's, it's in a place that is really inaccessible. You would have had to have walked, scrambled through a cave on your belly for the best part of two days, probably, to get to this point. And then not only that, you would have had to put your head down a shaft. It's the picture of a man being killed, it seems, by a large buffalo creature. And this image here, this tiny little bird on a stick, only ever happens when there's a picture of death. It's as if they're saying, the soul is flying. This is one of the magical creatures known as the unicorn. So they're not just representing what they see in real life. There's more to it. And then we have this, what is known as the sorcerer. It's a mysterious cave painting from a cave in France that's 15,000 years old. And it shows a half man, half deer kind of creature. In these lands, in Prudain, our spiritual journey begins something like 29,000 BC. In a cave uh, in the Gower called Paviland Cave, where we find the first ritual burial in Northern Europe. It was a young man of about 24 who was buried with red ochre scattered across him. He was buried with whalebone wands that had been broken over his body and a whalebone pendant. Now, he was excavated by a well-meaning reverend in the Victorian era who uh, found because they didn't understand the archaeological layers, they found two Roman coins uh, near him. And so he deduced that this was um, a prostitute of the Roman era who had died wearing a red dress, hence the bones were reddened. Um, and so she became known as the Red Lady of Paviland, but actually was a young man. But the really, really extraordinary thing, the powerful, powerful thing, is that after this burial, the ice fields of the last ice age closed over this area and for 10,000 years, nobody would have had access to this place. But 10,000 years later, when the ice recedes, people come back and lay offerings in this cave. Whoever this man was, must, his story must have been kept on the oral tradition for about 10,000 years, shared around hunter-gatherers' campfires as they were keeping warm. And that tradition of coming to this cave and leaving offerings 
and England clearly has scored, <laughs> continued right until the Roman era. Until the Romans. So that's the, that shows us how tradition can be built upon. Generation after generation, stories remain intact. Truths, wisdom can remain intact for a very, very long, long time and pass down. This is reindeer rock art in the Cathole Cave nearby. It's about less than a kilometre away from Paviland Cave. It was made 15,000 years BC, very, very early on. Again. And Kendrick's Cave up in North Wales, they found this, it's a, it's a horse jawbone. It comes from 13,000 years BC, and it's the thought of as the first ritual piece of art in the British Isles. Can you see these zigzag marks? We'll come back to those zigzag marks in a second. Every kind of culture on earth has its tradition of trance. Some dance into it, some drum into it, there's uh, different plant medicines to use, you can pray into it, you can meditate into it, there are many, many ways. In the Brythonic tradition, we don't seem to have drums. There's no drums in the archaeological record of the British Isles. There are some chalk, what they call chalk drums that are, were, were found, but we don't really think they were drums. They were more like kind of ornamental jars. But there are no drums in the British Isles. And what all of our myths and legends and, and poetry talk about is of music being a way into trance, singing. So there's a clue, we're going to do some singing tonight as well. And we call it entering anoven. That's our Welsh word for the inner deep. It means the inner deep. And it's as old as the Brythonic language itself. And really, really interestingly, I've been working with uh, Indian musicians from the desert regions near Pakistan recently. And Dara, who is a Kamaicha player, there's only 15 players left. And when he plays, something happens to his eyes. He kind of glazes over. And I asked him last time I saw him, I said, what happens when that happens to you, Dada? He says, I go to the inner deep. And I said, what? He said, I go to the inner deep. My father taught me that in order to make music, you have to bring the note from deep inside. It's not about what you do with the bow. It's not the technical thing. It's about where that note comes from. And I said, well, we have a word for that. It's called anoven. And we call what you call bringing the note out, we call that awen, which is our word for inspiration. The Brythonic tradition, awen is very important. It's the energy that connects all living things. And we talk about it going into anoven in order to draw out that inspiration that enables us to create and to live and to connect to all things. <coughs> So phosphenes, for years, many, many years, archaeologists have been um, somewhat puzzled by these kind of cross hatch marks. They look like hash hashtags. It wasn't kind of early man doing kind of Twitter hashtags. You know, keep, keep going this one, and there's one more. And these kind of patterns, see the zigzag <laughs> patterns? And the zigzag patterns on these. Now, there's, there's, there's thousands of, uh, of years between these different things. And it wasn't until archaeologists started playing around with magic mushrooms back in the 60s, they suddenly realized what they were. They're called phosphenes. They're the kind of things that you often see when you're entering trance. They're kind of the squiggles behind your eyes. Our early ancestors are showing us the way into Anoden, the way into trance. They're marking these things, saying these are ritual objects. This is a ritual place. This is where I go to dream. This is my dreaming place. This is my dreaming horse bone. This is the way to the dreaming. This is found in uh, a beautiful burial chamber called Barclodia de Gaures on Anglesey. And they're often found as well in, in places where um, there's a, a journey to the afterlife. They probably would have been very rich places for ritual as well. Some of them, we have a very clear indication, were fertility, places of fertility as well. Sometimes you see markings on, especially in the caves in France, where they show 
male, men and women copulating in them. They go in with the ancestral dead to create the new generations. It's quite a beautiful idea, actually. And keep going. Do you remember the, uh, the sorcerer earlier on? Well, in uh, Star Car, um, they found one of these. It looks like some kind of a ritual headdress for making that transition into other, for shape-shifting into the deer. Now, why they were doing that, we can't tell, but we know that they were dancing, they were making these transitions, they were becoming other, very shamanically shape-shifting into the spirit of other animals. And there's a lot in our poetry and things that tells of, of our poets becoming other creatures, becoming the tree. It's the sense of our consciousness is fluid. We can interact with everything in nature that is made of the same stuff of us because we're made of nature too. There we go, there's the sorcerer. In the Neolithic then, we, there's a big shift. It's the same people, but new technology comes in. We start to farm. We start to, to farm in around about, in the British Isles, 4,500. And a, a, a big change happens in the landscape. Instead of moving around and finding natural places and engaging with those natural places as you journey around the place, in the same kind of way that the Aboriginal peoples do when they go and walk about and when they, they journey along the song lines, they're now focused on one place. And what they do is to mark that place. They create kind of uh, earthworks and things to, to mark it in some way. They bring the ancestors and they plant the ancestors like seeds. They create these huge burial chambers that would have taken more than one community to make. Some of these capstones as much as 41 tons. Now they only had reindeer uh, antlers, they had the shoulder blades of oxen, and they had some stone tools, they had nothing else. They would have had ropes made of nettle and natural fibers, but they were moving <coughs> 41 ton stones in an effort to make these special places that they could put the ancestors. And in some of the chambers, they, most of them are aligned in a certain way. This one is Bryn Kellidhi in Anglesey, and it's aligned to the summer solstice dawn. The light comes in at summer solstice. Its sister chamber, Newgrange, um, this light comes in at the winter solstice and it's almost as if the light is a blessing and a way of kind of creating a circle in that journey around life from death to rebirth. This is a time of, of the cult of ancestors and a time when that cycle of death and rebirth, because they were farming now and they knew what happened to seeds, that even in the dead of winter, seeds were germinating. And they're showing that in what they're doing. Now, not everybody gets to go into these. They seem to be selecting people from their community. And we don't know why. Personally, I like to think that they're selecting them so that if you're going to select a seed, you want to know that it's going to do what you needed to do. Personally, I like to think that they were choosing maybe the midwife. They were planting, when she died, she was planted in there so that she could look after the pregnant women of the tribe. Maybe a good farmer, maybe he was buried in there because he had knowledge about how to germinate seeds or husband animals. And so he was put in there to help with the fertility of the land and so on. But we just don't know. What we do know is that the ancestors, once they went in there, they went in there as a pile of bones. They were put out for the animals to, to, to munch on first and to kind of get the, the meat off. And then they were put together and put in these chambers. We know that they were being brought out as well. So say if you had a baby, maybe you'd have gone in there and you'd have got grandmother's skull and grandmother's skull would have come out to bless the baby. And over time, grandmother's skull went back in the wrong place because archaeologists never find kind of complete sets of bones. Some have been taken off by animals, but usually somebody's skull that should be over there with that, the rest of that body is in the wrong place. They get mixed up. So people were going into these chambers and doing ceremony in there. And a lot of them have very special resonant acoustic qualities.
There's an interesting thing happening about stone as well. We've seen that stone is kind of carved and made use of all the way th throughout. But there's something interesting once we get into the late Neolithic, they're starting to create uh, stone circles and standing stones as well. And it's really intriguing to know why, we just don't. But uh, something that occurred to me, I was taking a pilgrimage across uh, the Preseli Mountains um, two years ago. And some of you will know the blue stones of the Preseli Mountains ended up as one of the phases of Stonehenge. Now the really interesting things, people have always focused on the quality of that stone. There's something about the Preseli blue stone that people wanted there. The Preseli blue stones that went to Stonehenge, they come from five different quarries. And archaeologists kind of can see where they've come from. They've matched them to the quarry sites. They've even matched the cuts. The really, really interesting thing is that many of those stones, it takes them about 300 years to get from the Preseli's to Stonehenge. So where were they in the interim period? One idea is that they were actually part of other monuments, that they were being programmed, they were being worked by. And it wasn't so much the stone itself as the people of that area that knew how to interact with stone in some way, to work with it, to work with its energy in some way. And when the call came from Stonehenge that they needed stone, they wanted some special stone, they went to this tribe of people who then went and selected stones from different monuments for the different attributes that they'd imbued in them, and then they got taken to Stonehenge. Spirals. Spirals seem to be something about life energy, the inward and the outward. It's also possibly another um, part of this whole thing of the phosphines, the, the ways into trance. But it seems to be something about the journey in and out of what we would call uh, Anoven or the other world. Keep going. You see them here in Newgrange and here again in Newgrange. Let's keep going. And again, they're everywhere. This is a really interesting stone here. Do you remember that, um, there was a picture here, Bryn Kelly the with a, with a green mound on top? This stone here with all the squiggles on it, the last thing that the people who bri built Bryn Kelly the did was to plant the tiniest bone in the human body, which is a bone from your inner ear in the center of that tomb then they covered it over, they put some berries down and they built a fire over it. When the fire died down, they put that stone over it and then they covered the mound with earth. Maybe they were saying, these are listening places, they're places for you to come and listen to the ancestors. Maybe. It's not the only time in the archaeological record in Britain where that has happened, where the smallest Ear, inner ear bone is planted in one of these monuments. It's a place to listen to the earth, a place to listen to the ancestors. When we come to the Bronze Age then, again there's a change. Beaker burials start to come in, cremation begins to come in, and they go from planting ancestors, the important ancestors in the earth, to putting them on the tops of mountains and covering them with stone, maybe so that their spirit can fly free with the wind. At the same time, they're going from looking at this tradition of ancestors to starting to look much more at the stars and the universe. And this is when we really see the stone circles and things coming in. Maybe, maybe it's a, an alignment to the heavens. The focus seems to be going from the land up into the sky. And then the Iron Age. Now by this time, there's trouble afoot. The Neolithic Age seems to have been quite peaceful. A lot of cooperation to build these monuments. When we get to the Iron Age, it's very different. This is the time of the Celts. When the Celtic, not so much an influx of Celtic people, but an influx of Celtic culture comes into, into Britain. And there's something has happened because we start to see really highly fortified hill forts. They're trying to keep people out. There's a lot of trouble happening. It's also towards the end of this time that the Romans come in. One of the things that typifies 
this period of time in terms of the spirituality of the British Isles is a cult of heads. They're fascinated with heads. They're making stone heads. Very often stone heads are planted in water sources. This chap over here is called the Hendy Head and he's magnificent. He was um, last found before he ended up in the museum in the wall of a farm on Anglesey. Now he's in a glass case in a museum and you go into the room and the Hendy head just resonates and it feels really pissed off, frankly, to be in there. But there was a tradition with the Hendy head that it had to be moved every 56 years. The top of its head, a place where libations would have been put, oils, leaves, offerings. And if you can see, there's a little hole on the side of his mouth there where a tube of metal was put in. It was called the Stuffel Kist Ifern. The pipe into, to give, that gives access to hell. You've got to remember that even the people who had been guardians of this tradition, which seems to have been a living tradition up until the last 50 years or so, were also Christian and, like me as a child, went to Sunday school. So hell and damnation was, was pretty much kind of there and thereabouts as well. But inside the Stuffel Kistifem was uh, a piece of paper and on it was an inscription, an invocation to the god Gwydion. Gwydion appears in the fourth branch of the Mabinogion. He's the scientist god, the magician god. He's the great magician of Wales. And the fourth branch reads very much like a druidic teaching story about the ethics of magic. And he's both the hero and the bad boy in it. But there seems to be a very active cult to Gwydion. And... Um, yeah, the Hendy Head is just one. We've lost the stories of so many others, but that's just one of them. Gold, they were big into gold during this time. And sacrifice. This man here is, um, was found, uh, I think he's known as Pete Bogg. He was found uh, having had a triple death. Now, when you find a triple death, number three is very important in the Brythonic culture as it is in many other traditions. But he was given um, a kind of a poisonous meal. He was garroted and then drowned. So he was garroted until he almost didn't breathe. He was still alive, but he went into the bog just about alive and drowned. It would have been a lake at the time. Now there's lots of offerings happening into lakes. We find many, many gold hoards and many, many um, iron uh, objects broken, made unusable and cast into lakes this time. Lakes were clearly uh, a way into the other world, to appease the other world. Now the interesting thing about him is he wore some fox fur around his arm and his nails suggested that this was no manual worker. Same with his teeth. His teeth, when they, they examined them, you know how they can do that, that, um, that work to tell you where, where the water they drank when they were young came from, what the, kind of, what the food was. Well, we know that he came from Ireland. And he died around about the time of AD 43, when the Romans invaded. And there is one theory, is that he was a, a druidic sacrifice. This is the time of druids now. That he was a druidic sacrifice, maybe, the biggest sacrifice of all, a human life, a prince even. So he was certainly high, high status as a way of stopping the Romans from getting to Ireland. It's one theory. I quite like it myself. But this is the time of Druids. And on Anglesey in North Wales, we know from um, the classical chroniclers that that was the central teaching place of the Druids. It was the nest of the Druids, which is why in Suetonius, Suetonius in uh, AD 60 sacked Anglesey because he wanted to wipe out the nest of Druids. The Druids were not just the priesthood of the Celts, they were also spy masters <laughs> that, um, that ran a spy network across the whole of Europe. And the Romans knew that if they were going to conquer Britain, they had to wipe out the Druids. Now the Druids were never totally wiped out. They became our bards. 
they put, what we're finding now is they put an awful lot of law into the early poetry and the mythology that we still have comes down to us. Some of that mythology we know comes from the Iron Age and even in some cases the Bronze Age and it was carried on the oral tradition for a very long time. So it's rich material. <coughs> this here, the opening of the, the, the Mabinogion, the great myth cycle of the Brythonic tradition, opens with Poich, the Prince of David, going hunting in Glyn Keich. Now the beauty of the Welsh language, the old British language, is that it's retained in the place names of Wales. This is Glyn Keich. This is where he went, and this is where he and Araun, Lord of the Otherworld, changed places. It's beautiful. People go there and they honour it still. You can see they've carved, carved a tree there. And then we're into the Romano-Celtic. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Romans. We are going to work with them tonight because it's inevitable in London, but I'm not a big fan. However... I do have to thank them for everything, something, because they did give us the name of many of our gods. They brought their own gods in and they fused them with whatever local deities they found nearby. So you have uh, things like uh, um, Minerva Sulis in Bath. We know that Minerva was the Roman, but Sulis was obviously the local deity. And they talked a lot. They were the, the, the Celts, any, all the peoples of this land before, they never wrote anything down. But the chroniclers, the classical chroniclers, they did. They were biased, so we have to take things with a pinch of salt, but they did open and give us a, a picture into those. And I always think it must have been such a shock to these people that are lived in small round houses with thatched roofs for thousands of years to encounter buildings <coughs> with square edges. Square edges, for a long time, it, it's apparently they're bad luck. That's where the evil spirits lurk, is in the corners of your houses. And so the old people didn't like having, uh, having corners in their houses. But yeah, and, and what, you know, just imagine, you know, these people who were guerrilla fighters coming against the might of, kind of these massive orderly region, legions. It must have been a horrific time. And then we're into the Dark Ages, and the Saxons arrive, and the saints arrive. And the beginnings of the, of the Celtic church, the Celtic Christian church, is very much kind of building on what has come before. It's a very beautiful uh, spirituality, and it isn't until much later when the Catholic church kind of harnesses it down that it becomes a problem. This is a time when the le legends of King Arthur arise. Now, you remember the young man planted in, in, in Paviland Cave. There is a tradition across this whole land of Amab Darogan, the sons of prophecy who die, but they don't quite die, but like Arthur, they end up in a cave somewhere, waiting, waiting for the time of need to arise, and they will ride out. Well, I've been trying to tell them the time of need is here, but nobody's ridden out yet. Um, but the young man in Paviland might have been the first of those and King Arthur is in that line. And th these kind of, this is the time when the Anglo-Saxons come into Britain. Some say it was an invasion. Some people think now it wasn't so much of an invasion as a gradual trickle. But they push the Brythonic, the Britons, to the corners, into Wales, into Cornwall, down into Brittany, and up into what for a long time was known um, uh, as kind of old Wales up here. So what do we know? From all of that kind of canter through a couple of thousand, quite a few thousand years, what do we know? We know that land is sacred in our tradition here. This unbroken tradition that is still there for us, land is sacred. We've been marking land, we've been putting our mark on it, we've been noticing it as sacred, we've been walking it and honouring it for thousands of years. This is what the Aboriginals say, and I suspect that this was true of us to a certain point. We have no books. Our history was not written by people with pen and paper. It's in the land. The footprints of our creation ancestors are on the rocks. The hills and creek beds they created as they dwelled in this land surround us. We learned from our grandmothers and grandfathers. They showed us the sacred sites 
told us the stories, sang and danced with us, the dreaming law. We've lost a lot of that, but we're trying to pull it back again. The song lines are still there. We can trace them in the land. It's not that difficult, certainly in, in Wales and in certain places in, in England, to find the <coughs> mythic lines where the stories are really, really strong, where you can follow the old myths and you, the place names are in the landscape. And that's part of what we do with, when we do dreaming the land retreats and pilgrimages. Stone speak. Stone is very important. Now, a belief that stone tree and Earth's ability to receive and retain memory, energy, secrets or knowledge is found in the stories and in the wisdom traditions of almost all cultures on Earth apart from here in the West, where we've kind of poo-pooed the idea. Most of the world is still animistic in its thought. We've lost that. <coughs> but if we want to reconnect with nature, if we start, want to start things, it's time for us to relook at these things, because there's, there's an awful lot it can t teach us about how to work and exist with our planet. These are hands, sati hands, in India. Trance or dreaming is a, score, is a core spiritual practice and it's a way of entering the other world, which we know as Anuv. Now it's not hell, it's not the underworld, it's the other world. It exists uh, alongside us all the time. It's the place where heroes are, where um, divinity is, where these great um, archetypes exist and our heroes and our stories go in and out of it in order to learn and grow and develop. And Anov means, or I told you earlier, the inner deep. It's about going into ourselves as well. And it's the source of Awen, inspiration. Awen aganav or duvn aduskav. I sing Awen, I bring it forth from the depth, says Taliesin, our sixth century poet. And just one of this uh, last piece of poetry for you for now. This is Taliesin singing about his origins, about how he was born in a, a piece of poetry from the sixth century called Cad Gothe. Nito va mathad am cre am creat, naurid llafan to fruith fruithe o fruith du dechre, o vriallia blode bre, o vlaud gwyn a godde, o pryd o pridret. Pam and digonet of loud danat o duivur ton nauvet am sunwid irath kin beam diaret. And if you click that, I'll show you what it says in English. Not of mother and father did my creator create me, but of the nine formed faculties, of the fruit of fruits, of the fruit of the primordial spirit, of primroses and blossoms of time hill of the flowers of trees and shrubs of earth, of an earthly course when I was formed of the flowers of nettles and the water of the ninth wave. Legends hold valuable keys. They were the tools of our Kavaruidion, and that word Kavaruid is our Welsh word for storytellers, the tradition of the storyteller. And there's so much more. That's just the tip of the iceberg. But there are ancient texts that we still have. The Black Book of Carmarthen, the Book of Taliesin, the Book of Aneirin, and the Red Book of Hergest are known as the great books of Wales. But they're not just of Wales, they're the books of Prydain, of all of Britain. It just so happens that they got lodged here in Wales when the Anglo-Saxons came and the tradition stayed with us. And for a very long time, we kept our hands very closely around the tradition. And then Christianity came in and we forgot about the tradition. We became somewhat ashamed of it because it talked about things that were taboo. But it's time now for us to kind of open our arms and to share it because this is the time when we need some of this really old wisdom that is intrinsic here to this land. We can learn, we still have a lot to learn from other shamans and people across the world because they show us where the gaps in our traditions are. But we all, those of us interested, we have to enter the dreaming. We have to open to intuition. Nobody gave our forefathers the book on how to do this. 
they were dreaming it up and using instinct and intuition to create it too. And so I think we are allowed to. Informed intuition is a good thing. We need to listen to the ancestors, tell the stories, create new songs where we've lost the old ones, walk the dream lines to honor life and our part in the web of creation. So we need to reconnect with this land in a very profound way.